Alrighty, welcome back everyone, it's Gorlan here bringing you another Neverwinter video. Uh, and today we are going to be diving into the Scourge Warlock Soulbinder Fury Mod 11 build. This is going to be a full DPS build, uh, mainly for single target encounters, uh, for boss damage, um, only for single target encounters. Uh, Soulbinder lacks a little AoE potential, however it still can work. Uh, but mainly the Soulbinder is strictly going to be pure boss damage machine. Uh, we're going to try to keep this as quickly as we can. Um, however, just some small disclaimers as always. This is what I am currently doing personally in the game. Uh, what I do and what you do uh, are going to be two different things, guys. Uh, depending where you're personally at in the game, you might have to make adjustments. Uh, this is an end game build. Uh, so if you're only 3k item level, 2.5, you know, anything less than 4k, uh, you will have to work toward it to see the true potential of the build. Or you can make adjustments however you see fit. Uh, you can take this base build and adjust it to your liking. Uh, but without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so first and foremost, you're right away going to see some uh, changes as far as the race goes. Uh, for the longest time, I was uh, Tiefling, Tefling. Um, however, now I'm to the point in the game where the Tiefling bonus... The racial bonus just doesn't, it's not justifiable for me personally. Uh, the tiefling racial bonus, as in you will do, you know, X amount more damage um, as the mob is 50% or less. It's basically the same ability uh, on the fire archon. Um, I'm personally to a point in the game where bosses don't last any more than a minute or less. Uh, you know, two minutes or less. So that added DPS um, from 50% or lower, it just doesn't even factor. Uh, and for this reason alone, we did switch to the Dragonborn, uh, which gives us 3% more power and 3% more critical chance. Now, like I said, this is one of those things where you have to figure out where you are at currently in the game. Uh, if the people you play with, you know, aren't destroying all of the content uh, and you get that increased DPS uh, at the 50% mark, uh, then t the Tiefling might still be a very viable option for you. Uh, you can also throw Human into the mix. However, I do believe that Dragonborn and Tiefling will both outperform Human uh, in the long run of things. Uh, but yeah, like I said, depending on where you are currently in the game, you're going to have to make that decision. Uh, are you killing things way too fast uh, where that bonus isn't really relevant? Uh, and would you rather have the 3% more power critical chance? Uh, and for me, it was an obvious decision to go with the Dragonborn uh, for those reasons alone. Moving right along, we're going to look at your initial stats. Uh, which nothing has changed. Uh, you're still going to go 100% full uh, constitution and charisma. Uh, so you want to have at least, you know, the highest base roles that you can if you're making a new character. Uh, and then you simply want to dump all those points into charisma and constitution throughout the leveling process. Uh, now we are going to go into the gear next. Uh, and like I said, there are different variations, uh, different possibilities. Um, for me personally, uh, the best in slot for me right now is the full vivified uh, relic armor, uh, which is going to be the helmet, obviously, uh, the armor, the arms, and the boots. Uh, now, there, like I said, there are some variations. To get the set bonus of the relic, you only need three pieces. Uh, you can substitute, let's say, your helmet for uh, a Harl's Gaze. Uh, which is going to yield you more power in the long run. However, you are going to lose some critical, sh critical strike. Uh, so you will have to make those decisions for yourself and what your character needs. Uh, now for the weapons. Uh, right now, relic weapons are still best in slot, guys. Uh, with Mod 11 just coming out, yes, you do have options. Uh, but the relic weapons are still going to be superior to the Mod 11 weapons. 
Uh, if you don't want to grind out the relic weapons, well, the Mod 11 weapons are still viable. Uh, the only difference between the two is, is that the relic weapons are a 10% increase, uh, and the Mod 11 weapon is going to be a 4% increase. Uh, now, of course, I'm talking about the Abilith set only. Uh, the Abilith will give you 4% compared to the 10% of the relic weapon. So you simply have to weigh in your options of... Um, are you currently even doing MSVA to get your legendary marks? Are you adequately equipped to be doing MSVA? Uh, the Mod 11 weapons are very easy to get, and they don't take any uh, special marks to level them up. Uh, so for that 6% difference, you have to, you know, kind of just make a personal choice. Uh, do you want that 6% boost, or are you completely fine uh, with, you know just the Abilith set. That is going to be 100% personal choice. Uh, I will be getting both sets. Uh, I will have the Relic set and the Abilith set. Uh, now moving right along, for your 3P set, we are still using the Orcus set. So we do have the Orcus necklace, uh, the Orcus belt, and then of course the Orcus artifact. Uh, shirt and pants, we are still currently doing the level, uh, item level 145. Uh, there is a one level, uh, I'm sorry, uh, item level 160 shirt. Uh, it doesn't have very good base stats, however, it does have a bonus on it, uh, that it could be useful in some situations. Uh, so if you really, really wanted to max your overall item level, it is possible to go a little higher than what I am right now, uh, by at least 15 points. Um... But yeah, just shirt and pants is typical. Uh, now let's talk about rings very quickly. Uh, I do have the rising precision and the rising power. Uh, ideally, I would like to have a brutality plus five, uh, but currently just in the cards, the way it sits right now, uh, the rising power and the rising precision is perfectly viable. Um, Basically, what you just have to balance your statistics. I'm going to say that a lot throughout this video, guys. And that's basically what it does come down to, is you have to balance your own statistics. Uh, as you can see, just for an example, as um, enchantments go, uh, we have four Azores in these rings. Uh, eventually, I would like to change those out to Pure Radiance uh, for more power, obviously. Uh, but that's going to be coming in later in the video on why I have to have you know four Azores here. Uh, and speaking of enchantments, we can go over overall enchantments, which we are uh, currently stacked all Radiance and Darks, I believe. Darks for the lifesteal and Radiance for the power and all necessary slots. Uh, your utility slots, of course, don't really matter. If you want to run Dragon Horde, Fey, Quartermaster, uh, even if you only want to run Darks and your utilities for the movement speed, that will be totally up to you. Now let's talk very briefly about armor enchantment. Uh, I am still running the Train Descendant Negation uh, by personal choice, uh, but there are options here. You can always run a Soul Forge um, or even an Elven Battle if you so choose. I just find that the Negation still works out the best uh, for the healing factor and the recovery factor plus the damage mitigation. Uh, it's just the best choice for me personally. Now we come to the weapon um, enchantment. Now this is the big daddy discussion, okay? Uh, so for Soulbinder in mod 11, uh, we're going to be going with the Fey Touched, okay? The Fey Touched will grant you soul sparks extremely fast, and that's what makes this build so viable is because our soul spark generation is so huge that we're able to cast Soul Scorch non-stop basically and that's where all our dps comes from uh does this outweigh using a dread uh yes and no it depends on your group composition and if you can have everything lined up appropriately uh the fey touch enchantment does scale since the recent changes so you want to put everything on your character that is weapon damage or raw percentile based damage as it will scale off of this as you can see mine right now is just a flat 24 percent uh i've had this well over like 240 percent already all buffed out and everything um so will it outperform a dread 
Uh, like I said, yes and no. It depends on the situation uh, and if you have all the appropriate gear to go along with this build. Um, and then also, for AoE, like I said, if you do want to swap out enchantments, like it's going to cost you a lot of gold to accomplish this. Uh, the lightning will work. Uh, with Blades of the Vanquished Armies, uh, you know, uh, Fury Bolt, uh, Curse Bite, Arms of Hadar, all those AoE spells will trigger the lightning enchantment. Uh, so if you really want to spend the gold and, you know, swap out the lightning while you're, clear, you know, clearing AoE trash in a dungeon, and then when you get to a boss, you know, put your Fey in, or your Dread in, whatever you can afford, you know, whatever you have. Like, I'm, like I said, if you don't have a Fey, this build will still work with a Dread, however, the Fey is going to work better for the build, just for the Soul Spark generation alone. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's going to cost a lot of gold. So if you want to run just with the Fey in, yeah, your AoE damage is going to be slightly less than, like I said, Hellbringer. Uh, Hellbringer's AoE damage is a lot more. Uh, but the Lightning does work, um, like I said, with all the AoE encounters that we do have. If you want to spend the gold to do it. If you want to spend the gold to change everything back and forth, uh, that'll be up to you. Now moving right along, let's uh, look at our weapon artifact powers. Uh, we do have Essence Defaller on here, uh, which increases it by 8%. And then followed with uh, Dust to Dust on our offhand, uh, which is another 5% raw damage. So that increases our Fey damage when it's all buffed up. Like I said, you want that raw percentile damage or weapon damage. Uh, and then we also have combat advantage. Um, now you can swap in action point gain uh, if you're lacking the AP gain. However, my AP gain is over capped, uh, so the combat advantage is just better for me personally. Now, as far as your two other artifacts, I can't recommend what you guys need to do. Uh, this is, you know, what I said about uh, balancing your statistics. Uh, currently, I have a Kessel Sphere, which is 1k power and armor pen, and then also a Thayan Book of the Dead, which is 1k crit and armor pen. Uh, however, currently my problem is, is that I have too much armor pen. Uh, so I'm most likely going to be getting rid of the Kessel Sphere and the Thayan Book of the Dead for something else. Uh, I'm either going to go with power recovery or crit recovery, or something else you know like I said it's all about balancing your statistics uh, I know it doesn't show that I'm capped but once my bonding pet goes off and everything else uh, which you'll see in the spell rotation video which will be in the link description um, you'll see that this goes up to almost 8k 8500 which is well well above the 6k cap uh, so yeah you have to balance your statistics if you need uh, more Azores in other places than just your rings or you have to put darks in for armor pen you guys have to take it upon yourself to balance your own statistics uh, basically you want to stack as much power as possible however you want to have uh, at least 6k armor pen uh, and then you want to be as close to as 100% crit as you can. So my crit right now is 60%, and once my bonding's procs and everything, I'm up to about 91-92%. So I'm actually a little short of where I want to, you know, to currently be. So, yes, my current statistics do need rebalance currently. Um, but once you do have your armor pen and your crit figured out, then you just want to stack power after that. Uh, you can go the recovery route. Uh, you know, it's a good route to go. Uh, my recovery goes up to almost 25k uh, when everything is procced. Uh, and I can basically spam everything. I can spam all my encounters, which ultimately leads to more DPS, obviously. Uh, but I think that's going to wrap it up for the equipment. I think we did go over everything we need to go. Uh, like I said, there's lots of other options. Uh, like I said, if you don't even want to go for the relic gear, you know, a life silk spinneret here will work. There's, there's multiple other options if you don't want the relic set. If you don't want to deal with the Vaughn and Blood upkeep, uh, there's other ways to go around it. Like, for instance, I think I have... 
Yeah, like the historian's Regala. Uh, yeah, you're going to lose a lot of power, but it has 2k crit on it, plus, you know, another almost 1400 recovery. So you can balance your statistics somewhere else. You can make up for that lost power if you needed the crit and recovery, etc., etc. So like I said, you do have to balance your own statistics how you see fit. Um, but yeah, I believe that covers race, gear, statistics, enchantments. Uh, so let's move right into the build itself. Uh, typical Warlock stuff goes here. You know, we're taking 4 out of 5 for Energizing Curse, uh, 3 out of 3 for Weapon Mastery, uh, 3 out of 3 for Empowered Rituals, 5 out of 5 for Determined Casting, 3 out of 3 for Devastating Critical, and then 2 in Blood Pack. Uh, now, for whatever reason, if you do choose a human, uh, you can put those three additional points right into Blood Pack. Uh, the damage bonus from Constitution is pretty nice. Uh, so I would suggest if you do roll a human for whatever reason, uh, you will get three extra feats. You definitely want to put them into Blood Pack and max out uh, Blood Pack. Now, like I said, we are 100% full Fury build. Uh, basically focusing on single target uh, DPS. However, we do have some AoE things in here as, like I said, we are full fury. Uh, you can make adjustments how you personally see fit or if you want to play with some stuff and try some different things out, that's up to you. Uh, like I said, currently this is what I am running. So we did go 5 out of 5 for Critical Promise uh, as it does have to deal with weapon damage. So the Fey enchantment will scale off of this, guys. So 50% of your weapon damage, you know, that adds in plus bonus of Fey. So we have 5 out of 5 for the Burning Soul. Again, it's giving us more damage. It's more raw damage. 0.3% per Soul Spark, which I think leads to like 9%, I think, if I do the math, something like that. 9% uh, overall uh, DPS just from this right here. Uh, now, we are taking 5 out of 5 to Offering the Prisoner, which I wouldn't normally do um, because it is an AoE kind of thing. Well, it's not an AoE kind of thing, but it doesn't affect boss battles unless the boss battle has adds. Uh, as you can see, when a, when a cursed target is killed, you get a 5% bonus for 15 seconds. Well, if it's only a single encounter target, boss encounter, you know, there's no adds or anything, you're not going to get anything from this. Typically, I wouldn't use this feat. Uh, if you do want to go into Dark Reverie, this is one of the ones that you would probably take away. Moving right along, we do take Infernal Wrath. Uh, your lesser curse basically, you know, uh, does a DR, 5% DR to mobs. Uh, and then we also take 5 out of 5 for Hell Touched. You know, when foes, foes deal damage to you, they become Hell Touched for 10 seconds. You do 10% more damage to them. Uh, Self explanatory. 10% more DPS, guys. Executioner's Gift, uh, absolutely. You know, at wills and encounters, 15% more bonus damage as the target's health diminishes. Uh, Killing Curse. Now, I never used to take Killing Curse. Very, very rarely I ever took this feat, ever. But since now we are dealing in weapon damage and raw percentile-based damage, uh, this actually does become a factor again. So when you're attacking a cursed target, you deal an additional 15% of weapon damage. And like I said, that is scaled off your Fey as well. So in a full buff group, you know, this does pump out some, some pretty good numbers, ultimately. Uh, finally, we are taking Brutal Curse as it's just, you know, a single target machine, you know. Uh, Warlock's Curse is already 20% increased damage. Well, this adds another 10% on top of it. Uh, and then, of course, lastly, you know, Creeping Death. Uh, now, like I said, I don't take Murderous Flames. Murderous Flames is, it just doesn't do it for me personally. I don't see the damage there anymore. Uh, you can take it if you do want some more AoE damage, uh, but that's going to be up to you. Like, you would have to, like I said, either take the five points out of Offering, uh, take the five points out of Hell Touched, uh, and then put them here. Uh, if you were to go to the Dark Revelry route, then, I, you know, you would have to take Offering, uh, probably Hell Touched, uh, and then you probably would have to get rid of Killing Cursed anyway. That's why we don't do it. That's why I'm not specced into Revelry right now. It's just because Full Fury 
is is definitely a single target killing machine uh and you guys will see that in the spell rotation video but like i said this is going to be what i'm currently running as a soul binder uh you could take this and mold it into your own uh liking you know you can even you know fool around with initial feats if you choose if you don't want the ap gain uh you can dump three points you know to increase your hp uh but yeah just little variations uh, of whatever you feel is best for your character currently. Uh, now, we are going to skip over boons for the video, guys. Uh, the written guide will have the boons in it, but, I mean, the boons have been the same. You know, nothing is changing with the boons other than the actual Mod 11 campaign. Uh, but the boons will actually be in the written guide. Like I said, the written guide link will be below, as well as the spell rotation video will be below uh, but we're not going to go over the boons in the video just to simply save time on the video now as far as companions let's start with the legendary one the legendary one can be anything you basically want guys the opportunities now for your legendary summon companion uh it can literally be whatever you want uh you have to base it off of what companion gear you currently want to use so whether you have for instance uh, rings from Storm King's Thunder. If you have Dodd rings, you know, uh, you can use the Dodd rings. If you want to keep, if you want to continue to use the Con Artist or anything that has ring slots, uh, if you want to use the Storm King Thunder rings, like I said, the Hell League that I have right here or the Dodd rings, they're all viable. Uh, however, if you don't have any of that stuff, if you don't have any adorable bites gear, uh, then you're forced to go farm Illusionist Gambit until you get gear. Uh, I was lucky thus far and got one fierce ring. Uh, the fierce rings are power crit, uh, and I also got a heroic ring. Now, the heroic rings are power and armor pen, um, so this is why I'm over capped on armor pen right now. Uh, ideally, this is not what I want to be using. Uh, personally, like I said, uh, I would like to be using the cell sword. If we look at the cell sword, uh, you can see that it does have three offensive slots, whereas the Con Artist only has two offensive slots and one defensive slot. Uh, now the equipment, on the other hand, is a waist, a necklace, and a sword knot. So basically, I have to continue to farm Illusionist Gambit until I can get the appropriate items. Uh, ideally, like I said, I need all fierce, all the power crit. So I would need a fierce waist, a fierce neck, and a fierce sword knot. However, if I don't get those items uh there are other other you know there's other companions available based on the gear that i do get uh what's so important about the con artist and the cell sword is obviously the you know the wicked strike uh and consumed by battle these actually have um abilities that help your overall group so wicked strike at two seconds uh does some damage it's gonna proc you know, your protector's camaraderie, it's going to proc your bondings. It's only a two-second cooldown, so it can keep up on all the stuff you need to keep it up on. Uh, but like I said, consumed by battle is what it's all about. The final strike of Wicked Strike now shreds 10% of the target's defense. Uh, this, this is uncapped, okay? <clears throat> it's never been capped before, so if you had three cell swords in a party, that would be 30%... Um, uh, 30 percent uh damage being shredded you know uh, and that's like i said that ca that goes on top of the cap already uh and the con artist does the same thing as well as the rebel mercenary uh and the only difference between the cell sword the rebel mercenary and the con artist is the gear that they use and for whatever reason the con artist does have that one defensive slot so those companions or in my eyes, best in slot, what we can be using to help out the team. Now, you can go 100% selfish, if you so choose. Uh, for instance, a lot of people still run the Fire Archon. Uh, this doesn't bring anything to the group. You know, it doesn't have any debuffs, anything. This is pure selfish, is what this is. Uh, so it does have three offensive slots, it does have two ring slots, and a talisman slot. So if you can get the appropriate gear from Illusionist Gambit, then the Fire Archon's a valid choice. But now we can say that, you know, for the Air Archon as well. Even though the Air Archon is melee, uh, and the Fire Archon is a caster, 
So ultimately the Fire Archon would be the best choice because the melee companion is going to be dying a lot more. But if we do look at the Air Archon, it's still triple offensive slot, two rings, and a necklace. So you have a necklace on the air, where you have a talisman on the fire. The drop rates in Illusionist Gambit are not good, guys. Whenever you get an Illusionist Gambit, that's what you should just mold your legendary pet after, you know? Uh, if you want to farm Illusionist Gambit 2,000 times until you actually get what you can get, you know, what you want for the Cell Sword to work, then be my guest. Uh, that's going to be personal choice, but there is a plethora of other companions out there that you can gear out. And like I said, it's all based off what companion gear you actually have now. Uh, of course, you're still going to want to use bondings. Uh, bonding 12s times 3. Uh, it's going to be best in slot. They still outweigh Ion Stones for the most part. Now let's talk about our actives. Uh, now like I said before, the Fey Enchantment is based on weapon percentile damage and also raw numbers. So for instance, we're going to be using the Wild Hunt Rider, which is this companion right here. 5% uh, chance to increase damage by 10 seconds. Uh, you shouldn't have any problems keeping the upkeep on this. It should be 10% pretty much all the time uh so yeah raw damage increase guys same thing with the air archon it's five percent uh and then so it's basically 5.5 .5 because we do have another archon with it and then as well as the siege the siege master it's a four percent increase damage if you're in the stronghold it's an eight percent increase and then once again uh we do have like i said the fire archon uh, unfortunately, like I said, we don't really use this effect as much uh, because we melt everything. But yeah, I mean, if the target does hit 50% or lower, then it's 7% DPS on top of everything else that you have. I think that's going to wrap it up for the companions. Like I said, there is a plethora of options available for you now. There isn't, like, the con artist before was the go-to for a DPS uh, obviously for the debuff that it gives, the three ring slots, uh, and like I said, you were taking a minor hit uh, with the defensive slot. However, the the debuff here, you know, consumed by battle, made up for what you were getting in power here. Uh, so yeah, as far as companion gear goes, uh, personally, like I said, I need all of the fierce gear. Uh, but maybe, you know, when you're balancing your character, maybe you need the heroic gear, you know? Uh, so it all depends on what you guys get. Moving right along, we are going to go into the mounts. Uh, we are still using pretty much the same thing. Uh, Assassin's Covenant, obviously, for more power. Artificer's Influence. Uh, Artificer's Persuasion. Obviously, these two together, uh, you should be able to spam dailies nonstop while using these two. Uh, Calvary's Warning for, you know, if you do have a legendary. If you don't have a legendary, you can put uh, Protector's Friendship here, uh, which goes along with Protector's Camaraderie. So you could put Friendship here or something else of your liking. Uh, but then you can notice that I do have all epic insignias. Uh, I look at the mounts as being bonus stats. This is another place where you can actually balance out your statistics overall. Uh, so for instance, I mainly have armor pen ones and crit ones. Uh, there are some power ones sprinkled in here as well as recovery. Uh, but majority of these are all armor pen, unfortunately. And like I said, my current situation is that I'm over capped on armor pen. Uh, but these cost a lot of ad so to switch all of these around costs lots of money uh so i will probably keep these the way they are and like i said adjust my stats somewhere else like i said the artifacts for instance i'll probably be you know changing artifacts um but if we do look you know uh my artifact power of choice is the tensors obviously for all the statistics as it brings to the table uh, your equip power, I'm using the 4k recovery because I personally don't have a 4k power one. And this build in particular kind of does actually focus on some recovery. So it's not, not too shabby to have that 4k recovery. Uh, one thing I didn't forget to mention was, of course, uh, your active. 
Uh, we didn't really go into that, but uh, if you want to use the sigil, the DC sigil, that's perfectly fine. However, during the boss encounters, you should probably switch back to your will of elements for that 30% uh, DPS increase. Uh, I forgot to mention that as far as active artifacts go. Uh, but you can use the DC or the will. It's going to be up to you. If you use the DC, you're going to be able to spam, you know, Immolation Spirits and Brood of Hadar a lot more. Uh, however, the raw DPS increase on the will is probably still going to outweigh it. So that'll be up to you. Finally, we are going to move into the powers. Uh, and unfortunately, we're going to go in depth in the powers um in the spell rotation video so for right now we're just going to go through it and i'll show you guys what we are currently using uh that's going to be eldritch blast for your at will um your secondary at will your main spark at will your main spark generator of course is going to be essence to fowler uh now you are always going to have essence to fowler equipped however if you don't want to use eldritch blast you want more ap gain then you can use dark spiral aura or you can also use Hand of Blight. That's going to be, you know, totally up to you guys. As far as personals go, let's go down here. We are using Dust to Dust. Uh, you will gain AP uh, when you're out of battle and your sparks do start to diminish. You'll gain AP off of that. And like I said, we are using the offhand uh, bonus Dust to Dust for more power. Uh, and then, of course, we all, we're all we also using ACC. Uh, all-consuming curse which basically just spreads lesser curse and increases lesser curse damage by 50% which is a little decent on the AOE side of things but like I said that's not what this build is focused on uh, our dailies we do have immolation spirits uh, and you want to cast immolation spirits alongside brood of Hadar so you, you want to definitely cast immolation spirits first most of the time because uh, it does generate soul sparks as well uh, but then, like I said, you want to be spamming Brood of Hadar for that single target DPS. Now, as far as encounter powers, we will go through the single target uh, spell set first. Your single targets are going to be Killing Flames. Uh, it still does buttloads of damage. Uh, and now we're going to go into Hadar's Grasp. Now, this is the main reason that you are using the Fey. The Fey en enchantment... Every tick of Hadar's Grasp, as long as your Hadar's Grasp crits, every tick will grant you Soul Sparks. So your Soul Spark generation just goes through the roof. If you're 100% crit chance and your Hadar's Grasp is critting every single cast, you're going to be gaining more Soul Sparks than you can cast Soul Scorch. Um, and that's where all of the DPS comes from, guys. I mean, you're simply going to... And that's, of course, our third... Uh, and final uh, encounter is Soul Scorch. Uh, and like I said, you're going to be spamming Soul Scorch uh, basically until your hand hurts. Uh, so, But we will get in more depth with that, like I said, in the actual rotation video. For AoE encounters, uh, there's a few different ways to do it. Of course, you can slot uh, Tyrannical for AoE. That's going to be up to you. Uh, but you're going to mainly use... Uh, Fury Bolt for AoE, uh, Blades of the Vanquished for AoE, uh, and then I've been playing around with Curse Bite, and it's actually not bad for AoE. It really isn't. You just have to remember that it's only going to hit the cursed targets, so you you should be already spamming your Warlock's Curse. But I mean, the the Curse Bite actually also hits Lesser Curse, so it works out with ACC. So if you're spreading Lesser Curse plus your Warlock's Curse, and you pop this Curse Bite, uh, it has a very low cooldown, uh, and it does some decent damage. I've, I've hit some 300k pluses with Curse Bite in an AoE situation. Uh, if you don't like Curse Bite, you can always go back to Dread Theft. Uh, if you don't like Dread Theft, you know, then you can use Arms of Hadar. Arms of Hadar is actually relevant again, uh, especially if you are using the Lightning Enchantment, uh, then it'll work just fine. So, that's going to be up to you. Like I said, we will go in more depth in the spell rotation video. Uh, a link will be in the description to that. But that's going to wrap it up for this video, guys. That is going to basically be the Mod 11, uh, Scourge Warlock, Soulbinder, 100% uh, Fury build 
uh, DPS machine for the most part. Like I said, during single target encounters, boss encounters, uh, the damage output is extraordinary. Uh, if you're geared appropriately, like I said, if you're in that 3k range or even less than 3k range, uh, you're not going to see the overall potential, unfortunately. Uh, you're still going to do decent damage at those item levels, uh, but you're not going to see the, the true potential of the build until you start to get closer to maxed out. Uh, so that's going to conclude the guide. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, if you do have something to say or something to add to the conversation, you can always comment below. Uh, like I said, the written guide will be on MMO Minds. A link to that will also be in the description. Uh, but we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy the build. Hopefully you use the build. Uh, let me know how it does go for you. Uh, once we do get mod 11.5 or 11B, that's where the true potential uh, of the Warlock's going to come out. Because you're going to be able to switch loadouts between Hellbringer and Soulbinder. So let's look forward to 11B. But for right now, if you want to be a single target machine, uh, I suggest going Soulbinder. Uh, if you want to go more group help related uh, plus have some pretty awesome amazing AOE damage uh, and the boss damage isn't horrible as well uh, but the Hellbringer isn't bad you know the Hellbringer is more all around whereas Soulbinder is strictly just pure DPS for single target encounters uh, so hopefully that clears it up between the distinction of the two like I said uh, Soulbinder does have some AOE potential with the lightning uh, but compared to Hellbringer it, I mean it doesn't even compete um, Hellbringer, as far as AoE damage, is just ridiculous. Uh, but if you are looking for, like I said, that single target boss encounter, then yeah, you should try the Soul Binder for sure. But that's going to wrap it up, guys. And uh, make sure you check out the written build. It'll be in the description. Uh, and make sure you do check out the spell rotation, because we'll go more in-depth with the powers, and I'll show you the rotations that you guys should be using. All right, guys, we'll see you in the next video.